currently going live. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this installation of Lunch and Learn. Just going to give it a couple minutes to allow folks to join. Thank you so much for being here today over your lunch hour. We're just going to get started in about a minute. We're going to allow some time for folks to join on both platforms. Thank you so much for being here today. <clears throat> Welcome to Lunch and Learn. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes. Thanks for hanging in while we give other folks a chance to join us. We're going to get started with our presentation in about 30 seconds. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and get started for this iteration of Lunch and Learn. Um, Welcome everybody. My name is Emily Levine. I am the Manager of Adult Services for Programs and Outreach at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Thank you so much for joining us for the August edition of Lunch and Learn, When Harry Met Elsie, Madness, Power, and Justice in Federal Era Baltimore in partnership with the Maryland State Archives and the Maryland Four Centuries Project. And now I'm going to turn it over to Bert for a special announcement and to introduce today's speaker. Oh, thanks a lot, Emily, and welcome everyone to our Midsummer Lunch and Learn Lecture. Uh, thanks, as always, to our great partners, the Maryland State Archives and the Enoch Pratt Free Library. On behalf of the Maryland's Four Centuries Project, though, I'm going to take a couple of minutes here before I introduce our featured speaker to tell you about our newest project. We are in the anniversary business. The closest big anniversary is the upcoming 250th of the U.S. in 2026. Now, we're launching a special initiative for that birthday to show off Maryland's unique contributions to the evolution of our country. Now, we're a small state, uh, 42nd uh, of 50, but we have a very, very big history. And our geographical position as a border state and our proximity to the national capital has given us an outsized role. We have created a Maryland mosaic, and uh, that's a, a project for the anniversary. It's a digital collection of Maryland firsts, events, people, places, objects, and buildings that are also firsts in the country. Now, I have a couple of obvious examples, the b and Railroad, Frederick Douglass, the National Road, Thurgood Marshall, and Maryland's role in the civil rights leadership, the Star Spangled Banner, and Rachel Carson and her book, Silver Spring. Now we have collected over a hundred of these from all over the state. And these are um, mosaic pieces that we wanna to put together to create a digital picture of Maryland's history, all 250 years from 1776 to 2026. Now the announcement today is we'll be launching our Maryland Mosaic website this very next week. It will describe the project and give many more mosaic pieces. And some of them are lesser known, some are surprising, and some are very informative. It will also give you an opportunity to send us your ideas of more good examples of Maryland firsts. Now, if we can get the slide up here, that's our logo, the Maryland Mosaic 250th, and we have two addresses that you can go to and find the site. 
MarylandMosaic.org and Maryland400.org. Now, we think this is a way to bring serious, substantive history to this anniversary and demonstrate the powerful story of our favorite state. Please give us a look. Now we're going to go on to our speaker. Our speaker today has a front row seat in our mutual quest to uncover and interpret Maryland's fascinating history. He's a member of our Maryland's Four Centuries Board, and we thank him for bringing his many talents and experience to our cause. As the Baltimore City Archivist, Dr. Robert Schoberlein is first and foremost an archivist, working as well as a senior staffer at the Maryland State Archives. He also is an accomplished historian. Now I ask you, how can you avoid researching and presenting great stories when you are surrounded by the archives of a city that is approaching its 300th birthday? And Rob can't resist that call. In 2021, he gave us an excellent lunch and learn about how African-American women supported the Union cause in Civil War Baltimore. Today, he's delving further back into the War of 1812 era. Now, being a great sleuth, Rob has found another city drama that touches on many issues, wealth, poverty, class, and eccentricity, which can border on insanity. Now, they all come together in the story of Harry and Elsie. Please welcome my good friend and colleague, Rob Schoberlein. Um, uh, to share my research with you. Uh, before I start, I just want to please note that some of the terms that I'm using in this presentation come from a period primary sources and contain language that would be considered inappropriate today. Um, also, some of the illustrations in the slideshow, um, namely the silhouettes, are intended to be representations of individuals and are not actual portraits of persons in the narrative. Here's the story, how it begins. Well, I should say, actually it's how it ends uh, to a certain degree. On a late September day, a carriage rolled down Howard Street. An unusual task awaited the four male passengers. The group's leader, though not granted any official police powers, had been appointed by a Maryland court to take a certain 32-year-old white male into custody. The carriage slowed around a corner in a, into a tiny alley, uh, eventually coming to a stop in front of a modest brick home. The men knocked, then swiftly entered and mounted the stairs of the house inside. They were, no, they were met with no resistance. A few moments later, the puzzled man, held firmly by each arm, was escorted down the stairs and out into the waiting carriage. He was then whisked away, never to live with his wife and child any longer. The year was 1812, and this man had been labeled, in the language of the times, a lunatic. The group leader was no stranger. He was the man's brother, and he had just been awarded the trusteeship of his sibling's person and estate by Maryland's Chancery Court. The legal actions concerning the trustee case of Henry Moore, a lunatic, deserve our attention. First, it allows us a glimpse into the life, a rare glimpse into the intimate life and limited rights of a person whose society labeled mentally ill. This was at a time when the public opinion largely defined the standards of what might be called deviant behavior. At the heart of this case, and is the question of whether someone considered to be exhibiting the behaviors of a mental disease could legally marry and enjoy the rights of other citizens. Second, the case illustrates inequities between social classes, genders, and races. Um, white racial bias against African Americans influenced certain decisions. Lastly, a review of these cases opens a window into the workings of Maryland's Chancery Court uh, it's equity court concerned with property matters uh, and its decision-making process. Um, 
Judgments, however, were handed down by a solitary male appointee for life. How equitable was the chancellor to the people whose cases came before him, regardless of their gender or economic circumstances? <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit. I'll introduce you to Baltimore and the Moore family. Um, so Baltimore, uh, milled wheat flour propelled Baltimore's dramatic commercial ascent. Its population and wealth grew um, throughout the late 18th century into the early 20th century, continued to grow. The city became uh, the third most populous in the country at that time. The Moore families timely moved to Baltimore from Pennsylvania in the 1750s permitted them to reap the benefits of the city's growth. By 1820, Baltimore was the leading exporter of milled wheat flour in the US and possibly the world. David Moore, 1750 to 1806, the patriarch, eventually assumed the family business and he ran a flour mill on the Jones Falls. He also made some lucrative real estate investments. Later, he was appointed as Baltimore City's Inspector of Flour, earning a fee for each of the many hundreds, thousands of barrels that went from our ports elsewhere. He retired uh, wealthy while still in his 40s, an early 19th century equivalent of a multimillionaire. Moore built a red brick mansion at the very north end of Howard Street. Uh, you see, I've delineated, uh, here is his house and his land up above here, uh, to orient you to things today. Uh, over here is Mount Vernon Square. This is what was called Howard's Woods at the time. So this is uh, not too far from the Maryland Center of History and Culture today, just west of it. <clears throat> so uh, a large red brick mansion featured gardens and there was an orchard this uh, this area here orchard and that's where orchard street gets its name today um uh, mr moore also held six enslaved persons in his household much less is known about mary kelly moore 1752 to 1831 david moore's wife here is her portrait painted by rembrandt peel uh, around 1797 I, it may have been, there may have been a portrait of David as well, but that is not in um, a museum. It could be privately held. Um, surviving court documents indicate that she was both intelligent and formidable. She managed the Moore household, including the couple's two sons. George Washington Moore, 1778 to 1822, David's eldest son, was outgoing, sociable, business-minded, and worked side by side with his father as a deputy, as the deputy Baltimore inspector of flour. He married and had seven children. Oops, excuse me. Henry Moore, um, 1780 to 1823, sometimes called Harry by his family and friends, appears to have been more intellectual, introspective, less commerce oriented. He studied higher he studied he had some higher education studied the law and conversed fluently in french he worked as a clerk for various businesses in his leisure time he enjoyed reading playing parlor games billiards and the piano evidence points to him being able to travel abroad his fluency in french for it is uh it was mentioned in a deposition that he had survived a shipwreck that occurred probably around 1806. The experience debilitated his body and his nerves. Henry's first alleged psychiatric episode occurred in September of 1807. <clears throat> he fervently embraced the Methodist faith and he began, he began to proselytize neighbors and passers-by. He would ask people if, um, he would basically uh, ask them about the state of their soul and if they weren't right with God, they would be going to hell. <clears throat> anyway, um, he also, uh, he wanted to preach. He wanted to preach outside of the city markets. Um, um, he even publicized it in a paper, Baltimore newspaper, but we don't know whether it ever came to pass. 
the Methodist church did not want him to go forward with it because he was not, um, he was not even a lay minister. He was just an individual. Um, but to many persons, Henry's religious obsession, it was an obsession, appeared abnormal. His mental condition took a distinct turn for the worse in 1808. Uh, two doctors examined and questioned him. One thought that he suffered mostly from nervous condition, while another believed Henry Street preaching. He had witnessed it and uh, believed him to be in a state of lunacy. Um, in the late spring of 1809, Henry's family brought him to the Pennsylvania Hospital, America's best mental hospital at this time. It was run by Dr. Benjamin Rush. He was there for three months undergoing certain treatments. We do not know what these treatments might have been. We can only surmise. Um, some treatments at that time were bleedings and copious amounts, blistering the skin, emetics to induce vomiting, and purges to induce bowel movements, and sometimes some hydrotherapy. Um, these were things that were routinely prescribed. <clears throat> We do know that between sessions, Henry enjoyed his leisure time by reading, writing letters home. He even had uh, a few visitors. However, Henry came back to Baltimore. A change in the Moore family home awaited him. Uh, George, uh, George Moore's sister-in-law recalled that a domestic worker, a young white female was brought in specifically to be a nurse or attendant to Henry. Alice Pierce, 1790 to about 1850, who also went by the nickname Elsie, had lived on her parents' rural Cecil County farm near Elknick uh, before moving to Baltimore at the age of 16 or 17, living with a relative. She sought work as a living domestic, the primary paid work of the majority of the unmarried young women at that time. Elsie started serving as Henry's informal sewing instructor, and the two began spending many hours together, even taking neighborhood walks in breach of what was considered, it was in breach of what was considered proper. Neighbors began to talk. Their closeness grew. One thing led to another. Elsie became pregnant and was supposedly sent away to live elsewhere. In the dawning hours of a snowy February 7th, 1811, Henry and Elsie married secretly at a house of a friend nearby the city spring on Calvert Street. The repercussions from the solid ceremony uh, uh, would alter the lives of Elsie, Henry, and the Moore family for decades. News of the marriage reached uh, the Moore Mansion um, that same day. And um, that evening, George Moore, Henry's brother, came to take him back. However, Henry resisted and struck his brother in the head with an, a flat iron, drawing blood before running away. Um, the couple were, Hen Henry and Elsie were reunited later on. <clears throat> Though the circumstances infuriated George so much so that he initiated a legal action designed to separate the couple. He promptly wrote to the Chancery Court to request that a writ of lunatico inquirendo be issued to determine the lunacy or mental state of his brother. The writ was the essential first step of declaring Henry insane in the eyes of the state of Maryland. Moore's George Moore's ultimate desire was to be named Henry's trustee and have control over Henry's person and his property. Elsie would then be prevented access to Henry's wealth. <clears throat> so let me tell you a little bit about the circumstance. So the county sheriff would gather about a dozen good and lawful men, and, um, and the person of supposed unsound mind would be put before them. Um, the group would ask questions, observe the behavior of the person, and after some deliberation, the men would affirm that the individual was the same, or maybe not. Um, but 
there was no doctor, no doctor had to be present, no one with any medical expertise. It was the opinion of this group of men. Um, so uh, George Moore wrote William Kilty. He was the chancellor, the head of the chancery court at that time. And so um, Kilty complied. Um, there was a inquiry, the group of men were gathered, but uh, it was uh, a little strange. Um, Henry was not there to be questioned. The men simply talked about him, I guess, and I declared him insane. Chancellor Kilty, though, um, uh, was unaware of Henry's absence and declared George Moore his brother's traditional trustee. Um, so George was still, I mean, uh, Henry was still hiding out with Elsie somewhere. So um, probably about 10 days later, um, um, Henry was walking along Howard Street and his brother saw him there. And uh, eventually Henry went back to the Moore mansion. Now it was probably uh, under duress, uh, but there conflicting, there's conflicting testimony, depositions relating to what exactly happened. But all um, it is known is that his, uh, his way was blocked uh, from behind by two of George Moore's enslaved men. Um, and the very next day, George Moore wrote the chancellor to request that Henry be returned to the Pennsylvania hospital. Uh, but um, the chancellor, considering the hasty uh, inquisition, the hasty panel of men, the decision they came to without Henry being present was very displeased. He just rescinded his appointment as Henry's trustee. Five weeks later, um, after Henry was taken off of uh, Howard Street, uh, Elsie penned a letter to Chancellor Kilty. And part of that letter said, basically, my husband has been unlawfully confined and separated from me. I shall not detain you with my present suffering of body and mind. Enemies of justice and humanity keep us separated. Uh, and the couple were separated. It would prove long lasting. Um, Elsie would give birth to a baby girl in May of 1811, naming her Malvina Rebecca, and Henry would not see her uh, until some seven months later. Um, so um, there was another gathering of men, another inquisition as it was called, uh, and this time they um, had a medical doctor uh, Henry was there, a medical doctor was present, asking questions to Henry. Henry sadly just sat there silent and would not answer any questions. So he was uh, declared insane. Um, and, um, but Chancellor Kilty was still not satisfied. He had the family, uh, uh, George, uh, Henry, and uh, their mother traveled down to Annapolis to meet with him. Um, he wanted to see uh, Henry Moore himself. He had been a doctor um, previously before becoming uh, a lawyer and the chancellor. And he really did not like what he saw. He thought that the, uh, there was a very bad dynamic between the family, um, especially uh, the mother who was quite resentful uh, that the marriage had taken place. <clears throat> Elsie, though, with a hand sort of, handful of supporters, uh, uh, mounted a campaign to have her husband return to her. She wrote the chancellor several times. In one letter, she wrote, uh, she wanted him to intercede on her behalf. Uh, she went on to say, before she closed the letter, and this is what's at the top of the screen here, she, she wrote, any man's name which is recorded on the records for striking and beating his father, I hope can't be considered a decent or entitable man. Well, George Moore seemed to have a past that he would prefer to remain hidden. A deposition by a woman who had once lived as a domestic in the Moore mansion outlined the various types a physical abuse applied by George and his mother to David Moore, George and Henry's father, 
within the confines of the Moore's Moore mansion. It was so bad that David Moore felt the need to go and live with a neighbor, presumably for his own physical safety. Um, <laughs> uh, David Moore had them indicted in the criminal court at that time. Um, and uh, the court of Oyer and Terminer. And uh, anyway, uh, the testimony was, I understand, heartbreaking. Uh, some of the older gentlemen who knew uh, David Moore actually shed tears. Uh, <clears throat> there was even a case where um, he was beaten with the branding iron that he used to um, brand the, the barrels of flour with. Um, so, um, court evidence. Uh, George Moore, though, took dramatic and proactive steps to counteract this evidence of this very negative aspect of his past. He had his many friends and associates. See, the job of flower inspector, he knew, uh, like his dad as well, all the movers and shakers in the city, between millers, uh, government officials. Uh, he had two petitions drawn up with over 100 signatures. And these are names that you would all know, basically, a former mayor or you might know <laughs> a former mayor but uh the ellicott brothers uh flower millers um uh, a former uh state senator uh, a sitting house of representative um and um actually uh the amount of documents that even survive today about three inches thick uh these were taken down and placed before um uh, chancellor kilty and um but uh, they didn't necessarily impress Kilty. He still seemed to harbor a lingering resentment against George Moore for everything he had did up to that time. Um, however, he still allowed Henry to live with his mother until the validity of the marriage between Henry and Elsie um, uh, would be determined, finally. Um, now, this is very interesting. Um, divorce in the... Uh, early federal period was very, very uncommon. Uh, in November of, uh, you'll find out in just a moment. In November of 1811, George Moore and his mother <clears throat> petitioned the Maryland General Assembly to have Henry's marriage annulled on the grounds that Henry had been mentally ill at the time of the ceremony and therefore could not make any binding legal contracts. Yes. During this time, all divorces and annulments had to be granted by a vote in Maryland's General Assembly. Uh, that is really uh, a subject that would be for one lunch and learn in itself someday. Uh, uh, a man has written a book on that whole subject. Um, so um, so um, after in the waning days of the legislative session of 1811, after a second reading of the bill, the General Assembly postponed further consideration uh, but for unknown reasons, no more action ever occurred on the bill. <clears throat> it seems as though um, the, the scholar who wrote that book said it was probably so complicated, they didn't know what to do. So, in January of 1812, Elsie is appointed trustee. What that means is for the first time, um, um, uh, Elsie, uh, as trustee, is um, can now be reunited with Henry, um, and uh, Chancellor Kilty. Uh, you know, the whole issue of marriage was still out there, but he thought that uh, by Henry living with Elsie, he would have the better uh, chance of recovering um, if if he could recover, basically, um, and so. The family uh, rented um, places to, to live. Um, the family settled eventually in a small alley house uh, on Strawberry Lane near the harbor, close to the Light Street Methodist Church, where Henry, Henry attended. Um, to both the casual and close observer, the family appeared to have grown accustomed to the domesticity of married life. A friend visited him a few days after the move and found them both sewing by the candle. Henry at that time appeared to be cheerful, rational, and happy. 
Another person recalled seeing Henry picking up and caressing his daughter Malvina, stroking her face and head tenderly with his hand while he cradled her gently in her arms. Uh, they, both Henry and Elsie, uh, made a very modest income uh, by making men's jackets for nearby tailor shops. This piecework was barely a subsistence. Seems as though the Moore family still relinquished financial control uh, at that point. Um, again, um, shouldn't they shouldn't have done that. Um, but George Moore, of course, was not ready to give up. His new strategy, um, he decided to play hardball. He hired a Cecil County-based lawyer to perform a thorough background check on Elsie Moore. The man, the attorney went to the Elknick area, interviewed people. He uncovered a secret that was intended for Elsie's family to remain deeply hidden. In 1805, while a young teenager, maybe 15, Elsie had given birth to an illegitimate child. That um, was what um, George and his lawyer needed. They needed information like this to defame her character. This revelation unleashed a concerted effort to have Elsie removed as Henry's trustee and have the couple separated. Ah, in mid-March of 1812, George Moore, through his lawyer, sent a petition to Chancellor Kilty uh, decrying Elsie's ability to continue as a trustee based on the, her immorality, even though her immorality. <clears throat> uh, Theodoric Bland um, was uh, George Moore's lawyer. Um, he acted as his attorney and he wrote a 10 and a half page, you could call it a, a screed. It was a lengthy character assassination of Elsie. He alleged that Elsie had chosen to marry Henry purely for personal enrichment. Lastly, he begged Kilty. This is not my quote, I want you to know. This is from a document from Theodor, Theodor, Theodor Bland's letter. This is his quote. He ended the document to, to uh, Kilty. Rescue the unfortunate lunatic from the infamy of a permanent connection with the mistress of the vilest kind of mankind the early mother of a colored bastard, the paramour of a slave." Unquote. Elsie's alleged child was of a mixed race, a mulatto in the language of those times. Bland used the blatant racism that was rampant at the time as a means to further influence the mind of the chancellor. Well, as you can imagine, Elsie's worst fear finally came to true fruition. In early August of 1812, uh, Kilty removed her from the trusteeship team. Why? Her newly uncovered past now disqualified her. Kilty, in his opinion, wrote that the allegations of the petition, he considers the fact is established and the immorality of this act affects her character, so it's improper for her to continue as trustee. George Moore, uh, basically becomes trustee of his brother and so is removed. The scene that I mentioned when we opened up this presentation takes place in September. Um, apparently physical abuse of a parent proven, proven in a court of law did not disqualify George Moore from assuming this role. Um, <clears throat> Kilty, however, did not abandon Elsie's cause in its entirety. He ordered that she receive $300 a year in support from Henry's estate and granted her weekly visitation rights. So the $300 uh, plus um, would, the $300 would go for her living and um, for Malvina, for the daughter. Um, it was not, she had, she would have to continue to work. Uh, it's not like, um, she would uh, have to give up working for $300 a year. Uh, so, um, um, but the thing about, can you imagine trying to visit the Moore mansion uh, to see Henry? What sort of reception would she have gotten there? Um, so, um, but we don't know the historical record. There's nothing relating to that to really let us know.
Henry's death and its aftermath. Henry's mental condition worsened with the passage of time. One deposition even hinted at Henry exhibiting catatonic behavior. He couldn't dress himself. He couldn't feed himself. Um, the circumstances surrounding his death in 1823 are mysterious. He did live one year longer than his brother George. <laughs> uh, but, you know, a lot of information has been lost to time. Even the exact date on which he died is unknown. <clears throat> his passing, though, without a will, soon unleashed a series of suits and countersuits that would last for many years. The Moore family hoped to um, establish that Henry's marriage was invalid so that Elsie and Malvina would be disqualified as his heirs. If the family proved successful in this effort, then George Moore's children uh, would inherit Henry's estate. The legal maneuvering dragged on for over a decade, even garnering the attention of Maryland's highest court. <clears throat> In February of 1824, Elsie Moore brought a suit against Mary Moore, Henry's mother, in the Baltimore County Orphans Court. Um, the woman, Mary Moore countered the petition uh, of the woman, in quotes, claiming to be the wife of Henry Moore, asserting that the marriage had been null and void from the beginning. Remarkably, despite possessing an outstanding legal mind, Mary Moore's lawyers, one of which was Roger B. Tawney, crafted spurious arguments as to why Elsie should be denied the role of administrator. The men relied heavily on discrediting Elsie's reputation. The, th the three-man orphans court heard testimony from both sides, much damaging to Elsie's cause. Um, however, rather than render a decision, the Orphans Court referred the matter to the Baltimore County Court for a jury trial in accordance with Elsie Moore's wishes. The Baltimore County Court um, had a hearing to decide the matter. Was Henry Moore of sound mind at the time of the marriage and therefore able to make a valid contract of matrimony? Uh, the 12 man jury concluded that he was not. Uh, and thus incapable of negotiating any legal contract. So it finally appears that the matter of the validity of the marriage, as well as who was entitled to Henry Moore's estate, appeared to be settled. Elsie Moore pursued no further legal action. Uh, George Moore's widow, Margaret Moore, was to become the administrator of Henry Moore's estate. However, as in this case, as in the story, that didn't end things. <laughs> Malvina Moore took up the fight over her father's estate. As Henry's only daughter and heir, Malvina wrote Margaret Moore on multiple occasions to demand her father's estate, what was due to her. Her letters were never answered. Malvina had become a school teacher. Uh, and uh, basically um, in 1830, uh, now married and known as Malvina Moore Ewing. Uh, finally, she petitioned and her husband, the Chancery Court, for assistance in obtaining her inheritance. But there was a new chancellor, no longer Chancellor Kilty. But do you know who it was? You will love this. It was Theodoric Bland, George Moore's lawyer. Uh, he had become the Chancellor of Maryland, and he would actually be the longest serving in the history of, uh, so he was sitting at the top seat. Um, um, so uh, Bland uh, solicited depositions regarding Henry Moore's mental state, his marriage and other aspects of his life. Um, all told, 75 pages of depositions, very detailed. And from these depositions, that's where I got a lot of uh, background information. Uh, very useful. Um, so, in 1825, uh, after reviewing the material, um, Bland simply dismissed the Ewing's case without stating his reasons. He could do that. He didn't want to do anything with it. Um, now, this was the time that the Ewing's um, uh, 
did something and uh, they immediately appealed his decision to the Court of Appeals. That was Maryland's highest court. Um, a number of years passed. So 1825, uh, 1825, it's dismissed. In 1834, the court accepts their case. It was four years after they filed a petition. Um, so they get the notice, but another year passes. Uh, so the court reviews the depositions and they listen to seven days of several days of attorney arguments and they uh, were going to render a final verdict, but they, they postponed that for another six months. This is agonizing. In the mid in mid July of 1836, in a three to two decision, in they had a decision and it was in favor of the Ewings. What was the basis of the decision? That the only body to decide the validity of the marriage was Maryland's legislature, and that no tribunal can annul such a marriage and declare the same to be void after the death of either or both of the parties. So the Ewings were victorious. The matter was sent back to Chancellor Bland to coordinate the administration of Henry's estate. Malvina uh, got the money and uh, um, uh, they did a number of wonderful things with it, which I'll talk about in a moment. Meanwhile, the land around uh, Moore Mansion was being developed. This is a, a print from 1835. Um, so the Moore Mansion where my arrow is would still be off the screen, but uh, this is the uh, Baltimore, this is the Washington Monument. That's the uh, Unitarian Church there. And this gully here would probably be Center Street. And uh, eventually Center Street runs through the Moore <laughs> Mansion land. Um, but um, about Elsie Moore, so what happened to her? Well, Elsie did remarry uh, after um, you know Henry passed away. She married a Mr. McVitie um, around 1825, uh, but was soon widowed again. Uh, eventually, she moved to Lancaster County to be near her daughter, Malvina, uh, and she died in about 1850 and is likely buried in Pennsylvania. Now, Malvina Moore Ewing and her husband and four children relocated from, from Pennsylvania to Maryland in 1858. Uh, they lived in Mount Washington in that area first. Um, Malvina's son, whose couple, well, first of all, before I go on. So what this is, this is an image of the land division plat. Uh, so, uh, Basically, uh, the Moore um, estate was divided into, uh, you can see, uh, uh, smaller plots. And uh, the Ewings actually leased uh, land uh, to uh, an upcoming African-American church that had free African-Americans and enslaved individuals as well. They built their own church. It became known as what the Orchard Street Church. So... Uh, they uh, they also did a number of wonderful things with their money. One of their sons, um, um, quite smart, uh, went to medical school. Malvina's son, whom the who the couple named Henry Moore Ewing, received his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania in 1857. He came and lived in Baltimore County and uh, was actually um, he practiced, and he actually was named uh, the, the, the doctor of the, um, the Baltimore County Almshouse. And so he probably uh, took care of individuals that uh, had physical ailments and also uh, perhaps uh, mental diseases. Um, there was always a, a population uh, at that time who would be housed in almshouses. Now, what about Margaret Moore and her family? Um, well, um, they continued to squabble among themselves about the remainder of George Moore's estate, George Moore's estate, well into the 1840s, the conflict spawning three new Chancery court cases. Um, and then uh, in 1840, Margaret's son, the one named after his father, George W. Moore Jr., 
uh, was described as being in a weak state of body and of unsound mind. Um, that same year and for several years thereafter, a George Moore from Baltimore is recorded in the patient register at the Maryland Hospital for the Insane. Um, is it the same person? It's uh, Mary, very well might be. Thus, the Moore's family's use of the legal system and the mental health institutions continued. And uh, if you want to um, know more, I suggest you read the article in its entirety. It's in the Maryland Historical Magazine. It's a half an hour read, but it's very detailed <laughs> um, because there was so much primary source material available for this, uh, for this case anyway. But I do thank you for your interest and I'm, I'd be ready to take any questions that you might have. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Rob, for that informative um, presentation. We have some um, questions that are coming in from folks online. Um, so I'm happy to see that. Um, if you all are joining us from um, our YouTube or our Facebook, please go ahead and post any questions you have for Rob in the Q&A or the chat, and we will get to them um, in the next 10 minutes. Um, Jenny would like to know, was George Moore punished by the court for the abuse of his father? Well, it doesn't seem as though he was he was fined. That's about it. The court of Terminer and Oyer, Oyer and Terminer, basically, um, uh, he was fined and he paid court costs, but not that he was jailed. I mean, he was the flower inspector. Uh, he um, actually uh, there was a second one appointed as well because there was so many barrels of flour that needed to be um, um, inspected uh, that um, the city had to hire a second person. But no, there doesn't, didn't seem to be any repercussions to him. He continued to hold um, um, almost until his death uh, the position as uh, inspector of flour. Um, and also, too, um, uh, he knew very many influential people in the city, uh, it just uh, both he and his dad. Uh, beforehand, you would just come into contact, um, uh, city officials. Um, anyway. Cool. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit, Rob, about how you started in on this vein of research and work? <laughs> with pleasure, with pleasure. It's going to take more than 10 minutes, but anyway. Uh, no, I was going to say, um, I, okay, I was doing my doctoral dissertation. And I was looking for uh, things that I could use. Uh, I did. I did a general uh, overview of the care of the mentally ill in Maryland, and uh, this was a case that I uncovered back in 2003. I wanted to go back and uh, take another look at it. I thought, well, maybe it's so much. Maybe after I retire, but pandemic happens, and so I was able to do research uh, during the pandemic and. Uh, with the approval and uh, I should say prompting of the state archivist, Tim Baker and the new state archivist. Uh, well, she's not new any longer, Elaine Rice Bachman. And I appreciated their support. Um, anyway, um, um, how, to, how this all came about, I literally had to uh, organize uh, probably about a box full of papers. Uh, they were in no order whatsoever try to categorize them. So I had to more or less process these documents to begin with. And uh, um, anyway, that, that's basically it. I've, I've had this interest uh, uh, for many years uh, because I noticed there was not a lot of work done um, on uh, the mentally ill in the state, uh, or I should say, use the word, people with mental challenges. Um, and, yeah. uh, it's sort of like uh, their existence was never acknowledged. Um, so I've tried to do what I can. Interesting. Um, can you talk a little bit about Henry's religious affiliation within the context of his potential psychiatric yeah. um, conditions? So, so here's the interesting thing. I could go on about, so Methodism in Baltimore, it's really sort of interesting because there was this great fervor uh, that 
generally among the working classes. Um, and there was a lot of preaching that went on and there were Methodist preachers that would routinely um, uh, preach, I think outside the Lexington market, but there are other, there's evidence elsewhere that uh, at uh, certain streets, people would set up a table, but these were necessarily, uh, these were representatives of the church that just wasn't a street preach, preacher with no denomination. Um, but both uh, Henry and his father, David, uh, were uh, devout Methodists, actually. Um, they even uh, had prayer meetings in their home, Moore Mansion. Um, hmm. um, but how unusual, uh, there was a lot of religious fervor going on. Uh, was it very, um, deviant? Probably not, as what you might imagine uh, during those times. But uh, unfortunately, I was never able to really gain access into the Methodist archives. Um, it was during the pandemic, and their archivist actually um, um, resigned the position. And uh, hmm. I thought it would be nice. There are other aspects of this uh, research I'd like to look at, too. The, the people that supported um, Elsie, um, there were a number of people. There was a lay, menace, lay Methodist uh, minister, but there was a, a German immigrant uh, who seen a Leonard Powder, P-O-U-D-E-R, and we have some things. His, his name was, a, sounds like it was Americanized, but uh, uh, he signs his name, German. He's a German, uh, and he made some money somehow, but he um, was looking out for the couple. Uh, they may have uh, been renting uh, one of his houses. He lived nearby. Uh, and so people were like supporting both Elsie and Henry uh, so they could live independently. Um, you know, Henry would have these episodes from time to time. He'd wander from the house insensible. Um, one time he wandered 12 miles down to Elkridge people recognized him at the stagecoach um, tavern mm -hmm. down there. And uh, mm -hmm. he was sent back to Baltimore. Then another time he, he, he left the house in his nightshirt and uh, was wandering the streets of Baltimore near Light and Pratt. They found him and um, there were city, uh, there was something called the night watch. There were some city officers looking for him, but also this fellow Leonard powder uh, looked for him and they brought him back and so it was really sort of interesting that there was a community looking well even when henry was on howard street when he was uh if you want to say proselytizing or asking people about their souls some of the neighbors um seemed to be sympathetic uh and they would invite him in to their house to have lunch um and talk matters of religion. So where I'm coming from is that, so what we have, we have all this documentation, we have uh, letters, we have testimony, um, and there are many aspects to who Henry uh, was. Um, and uh, certain, uh, certain really um, multifaceted, multifaceted. Sadly, though, there are only one or two quotes from him, it's that a supposed direct quotes. So we don't, we don't get his voice per se. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> we have time for one more brief question. Um, in about three minutes or less, can you talk to us a little bit about the hidden histories or which you have mentioned, the hidden histories or narratives of folks with mental illness around this time and why it might be difficult to learn about them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I'll tell you about Henry. I could probably know exactly what um, there are specific laws. Since Henry was at the Pennsylvania Hospital, <clears throat> the, the hospital that's still in existence today, uh, because uh, it's privileged information, health information, uh, they're not allowed to release uh, that information. Um, mental health. Uh, also, besides that, there's a state statute in Pennsylvania that, that guards information on uh, mental patients. So even far back as the early 1800s, um, 
But generally, um, routinely, a lot of um, the early records, if we're going to just talk about that, um, either there was a case book that was uh, prepared by, you know, the doctors uh, that doesn't survive. Um, or um, if you're talking about the time of the hospitals, uh, five patient files as they exist, as you might imagine, was more late 19th century, early 20th century. And uh, a lot have, have just been routinely destroyed over uh, the years. In fact, uh, Maryland State's hospital, the health and mental hygiene department routinely, uh, there was a big purge of patient files, I want to say in 1962. So everything prior to that um, was destroyed. Um, so sometimes you can get a glimpse of these lives through looking through other documents. Court files has been a great one. Uh, there are other files. There's the Baltimore County Chancery Court. Uh, there are other um, that you can have snippets, but I've never come across one. This is this amount of documentation is just remarkable. Um, but uh, it's very tough, as you can imagine, uh, to get a full picture because they're always being acted upon. You know. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rob, so much for such an informative presentation today. It was really awesome to listen to. Um, if anyone listening on this call would like to read the full article, it is still available on our website, Enoch Pratt. If you go to our events calendar and Lunch and Learn under Rob's event, you can access the full article um, to read about this fascinating story. Um, I'd also like to thank our partners at the Maryland State Archives and the Maryland Four Centuries Project um, for helping us coordinate this program today. And as always, thank you so much to the Hearing and Speech Agency in Baltimore for providing us accessibility for today's program. Uh, finally, thank you, the audience, for joining us this afternoon. I posted our um, program survey in the chat. If you could please fill that out while you're still online, that really helps us figure out what you like um, and how we can program better for our patrons. Um, that concludes today's Lunch and Learn. We hope to see you all next month. Thank you so very much and have a safe afternoon. Bye, everybody.